Hello everyone, it's William with Quarantine Studio again, and in this episode I want to talk to you about customizing your pre-painted statues. Now here you'll see that we have our latest release from Quarantine Studios, the Conan the Brutal, and in this case this is actually a customer's piece that was sent back to us, and he wanted me to customize it just a little bit. And so that's exactly what I'm going to do for him. Now, you can see here to my left, I have another Conan. Now, this was our first Conan release. This is just Conan the Barbarian. Uh, this happens to be the deluxe edition. You can see because it has the axe, these actually have switch out hands and that sort of stuff, um, which uh, that one's stuck in there pretty good. There we go. Nice uh, grip on that. But it does have another sword that can be put in here, and that's I kind of left uh, the uh, the ability to switch the hands out because I kind of like that. Uh, but that too can be customized. I could permanently affix that in there. Uh, really, the only thing I did to this particular statue was the addition of the snow. And, um, you know, I've added. Um, uh, this was some railroad scenes material uh, to put a little snow on here. I just wanted to break up that base a little bit. That that was just a lot of red in one spot there. So I broke it up here, put a little snow drift on it here, and I've put some snow on his boots, on his hair, and on his skin. And I've even made it to where the snow has melted on his skin a little bit so it looks a little wet there and things. Um, and, and now to me it looks maybe a little funny. Maybe he needs some leggings on here. So I will most likely go back in here in the next uh, round and actually put uh, maybe some leggings on him and perhaps even a tunic of some sort. And of course that will entail some sculpting. So uh, for this particular episode, I'm not going to get into this. I, I just want to show you what is possible here. And, and this is just the initial stages of customizing this particular kit. Now, the one I'm going to focus on is the new kit. Now, here at Quarantine Studio, we made an executive decision about the color of the skin tones on Conan. So, we've seen Conan in this uh, kind of cocoa brown color. Uh, a lot of times, a lot of different people do it in various uh, shades, but he's always been dark complected like this. Nothing wrong with that at all. We just thought we'd take a different approach on it. And we went more of a, a Eurasian type of look, I guess is what you would call it. It's not really a, a light uh, Caucasian color, uh, but it does have a little bit of a hint of that. It's, it's a little more of the olive color uh, skin tone in there. And you know, some people love it. And then there are a few people that just maybe not as impressed with it. So uh, what I wanted to do was just shoot an episode here to show you that, you know what, you can modify these. And if you don't have the paint skills to do it, hey, that's okay. If you're just a collector and you just really don't want to paint these things, that's fine. There are services out there uh, that will do that for you. And so what I wanted to do is just show you what is possible just by adding a little bit of paint to an already pre-painted statue. A lot of people find this to be a dark art. It's really not. Uh, I know plenty of uh, modelers that will do this very same thing. They'll buy a statue because they just like the sculpt itself. Uh, but then they'll just go over and rework the uh, paint. Now I've seen some people just completely nuke the paint that's on here and start over uh, by either soaking these in chemistry uh, and uh, getting the paint off of them. Uh, other folks will just use uh, a primer, like an automotive primer, prime the whole thing a gray or a white or something like that and then start painting from there. And then other folks, uh, well, you know, they just kind of going to do sort of what I'm going to do here. There are certain colors and things in here that I think are great. I'm just going to add to it. Now, in this particular case, the, the client was, as I said, not extremely happy with the skin tone. He wanted more of the cocoa color. So basically, everywhere there's skin on here, it's going to look more like this guy over here. Um, everything else, though, is pretty good, but I may add a few more touches to it, add a few more highlights, add a few more shadows to it. You have to keep in mind that these are produced in a factory. Yes, they are hand painted. Don't get me wrong there. It's not a machine painting these things. It is actually a team of artisans that are painting these. But in a case of something like the Conan statue here, there are several hundred that they have to paint. So, um, and the bigger the addition size, you know, some of these additions, they get up into the two and 3,000, maybe even 5,000 range. Can you imagine hand painting 5,000 statues yourself? 
I know I can't. So, uh, you know, there is a little give and take. While they do hand paint this, they maybe don't spend the time that an artisan would that was doing a one-off or maybe even two uh, or a smaller number like that. There's just no money in it for, for folks like that. So if I'm going to spend, you know, five or six hours painting this thing up, or my goodness, it could be even more, well, then I can't sell it for the two to three hundred dollar range. It's going to have to go into the several thousand dollar range. So that's the dilemma. And most people in the collecting of statues, they understand that. They understand that, hey, you know what? It's not going to be every little hair painted, but I'm not paying several thousand dollars for this thing. I'm spending a couple hundred bucks, maybe. So, you know, like I said, for most people, it's great. I can view it from, say, a foot or two away, and it's beautiful for what it is, and I can respect what the people have done to it as far as the artisans that are doing the paintwork. And I think they do a great job to be able to turn out as many as they do. But, like I said, occasionally, you know, maybe you want to tweak it a little bit, and it's easy to do. There's no real magic here to it. You just have to decide at what level do you want to take this. Do you want to strip it all the way down, or you just want to add to um, what's already there? So, uh, enough of my gabbing. Let's get on to the process of painting up this uh, new release here. All right, so now we've got Conan here on the workbench. And one of the first things that I like to do is determine, well, one, you know, what's going to be painted, what all type of work am I going to need to do here, and that sort of thing. And um, then that just kind of helps me. I'm just planning for how I'm going to paint and what I need to do. Now, for the most part, I see the... The base looks pretty good. I may go in and detail that a little bit more, but I'm not really going to focus on that. My, my attention is really here on uh, Conan himself. Uh, the base is just kind of secondary at this point. And, you know, one of the other things with pre-painted statues is that if they have extra components like the axe, the shield, and the sword here, well, those components are generally glued into place. And they usually use an epoxy so that it'll last for a long time. And so that can be a real concern for a lot of folks. It's like, wow, how do I take it apart or can I even take it apart? And yes, you can. Um, it would, re uh, would generally require some chemicals once again. Um, one of those chemicals, and let's see, I'll just reach up here and grab it. This is just one brand, um, but this is called Purple Power. Uh, this can do a lot for you, actually. Um, uh, this is just one brand. There's others. I got this in Automotive um, Supply Shop. It's a really... Uh, heavy duty. You can see it's concentrated industrial strength cleaner degreaser. This stuff is amazing. It will it will dissolve the chrome off of a bumper, folks. It is that strong. So you got to be really careful with it. Um, it is uh, typically it's intended to be diluted with water. I generally don't do that. I'll put a bath of that uh, chemical um, in a vat of something that I can put the statue in and I can soak the statue in there for a little bit. It will dissolve every bit of that paint. It'll take it right down to the raw resin and a lot of times it will affect the glue in a very similar manner. It'll kind of harden up the glue even more, make it brittle or sometimes gummy. It really depends on the glue but then the parts can come apart. Now I'm not going to do that in this case because I really don't need to uh, the other choice that you have in a scenario like this where I've got all these pieces that are overlapping, they're kind of covering up the places that I want to paint, is simply just masking. I mean, that's just old school um, uh, way of model building. So uh, it's been around forever. You just want to mask off or hide a particular part of a, an object while you paint over it, and that way the paint doesn't get behind the mask. Now, there's different types of masking. So, of course, you have the good old standby of tape. I like using the blue tape. It's a low-tack. This is a painter's tape, um, and it's great for, for large areas and stuff like that. You can tear it, and, and you know, I can make uh, little, little smaller tears in it and just, you know, kind of make little fillets, as I call it. And, you know tear this just a little bit more maybe and make these little small pieces and come in here and I can fit this around let's say I wanted to paint his belt but I didn't want to get the skin tones uh, messed up I could do that just kind of fish this down into place like so and then I can work my way around that and that way when I'm spraying this maybe with my airbrush I'm not getting on these skin tones so tape is obviously a great option especially for larger areas 
works uh, perfectly well for that. You may have to, you know, spend a little extra time doing that uh, with the tape. Another way to do this is to use a masking fluid. Now, a masking fluid is basically latex. So if you can get your hands on a larger bottle of latex, liquid latex, uh, you can usually find this at, um, well, sometimes the hobby shops will carry these. Um, they'll use the latex for uh, railroads types of stuff too. So if you find a place that has like railroad uh, building supplies, you may find some liquid latex in there. Otherwise, if you go to a, a standard model shop, uh, they have this called liquid masking film. Uh, this is, um, oh, let's see, I, don't even, I can't even read who this is from. But anyway, this is basically latex. And as you can see, it is not cheap. That was $7.10 for that little tiny bottle. Uh, I can buy a, I don't know, maybe like a 32 ounce bottle of uh, latex for about three bucks. So it's really cheap. Um, if you buy it like this, it's a little more expensive. Now, the one thing that this does have over uh, regular latex is that this has been pigmented. So I can see exactly where I've painted on. A lot of times you don't get that with latex because it, it's it's clear this has kind of a light blue color to it so that's kind of nice uh, is it worth the increase the dramatic increase in price no not really it's just i happen to be out and i like supporting my local hobby shop so i don't mind paying a few bucks more for something that i need anyway and uh and it helps keep my local hobby shop in business so when i do need those little things uh they are there uh, so once again, uh, you can use this sort of stuff. It's great. If you don't need a lot of it, this is perfect. If you, if you do a lot of this type of work, you might want to go for the larger economy size of just liquid latex. So there's that, uh, two options there. And I will probably use both of these options. In this case, the liquid latex comes in great when I want to do detail areas like his hair. Maybe I don't want to have to repaint his hair. So I might just cover up the hair as it is now. And then later when this liquid latex uh, solidifies uh, after I, I paint the piece I can just peel the liquid latex off and there you go it's perfect so uh, a great tool liquid latex and then finally uh, I just like using plastic bags um, I use these to fill in certain areas so uh, in this case the base is what I want to mask I'm gonna show you how I'm gonna mask this in just a few seconds I have a, a piece of foam here. This is just a piece of packing foam. I keep this around and I, and I use it to prop pieces up on. And I'm gonna use it right now to, to hold Conan for a moment. If I can get him off of his base, these pins work so well, sometimes it's hard to, to free them. There we go. And so now I'm gonna lay him kind of here. I think I'm gonna have to lay him face down maybe a little bit. I don't want to put any pressure on his weaponry here. So there he is. Perfect. And that'll give me enough time to just take the base, slide it right into this bag, and take the bag and wrap it under just like so. Now, what else do I do with this? Well, kind of pull this out. I'm just trying to get it where to lay flat because I need to find the holes where his feet go again. And then look at this. He just sits right back in that same spot. And now I have a base to hold him in place while I paint. And I know that nothing's going to happen to the actual base underneath. Uh, sometimes, you know, you might want to double back it just to make sure. This is just a shopping bag from the local grocery store. And here is the problem with shopping bags. I don't know if you can see this on the video or not, but sometimes they have these little holes. So be very, very careful with that. Watch for those. Uh, it's just part of the manufacturing process that those get uh, those little holes in them. And so what I do, if there's just a couple little holes like this, I'll put a piece of tape over it. But this is also a good reason for double bagging. If I put another bag, say, from another direction on there, well, it's going to cover those holes completely. So there you go. Uh, a nice quick little mask here. I might even take a little, uh, little piece of this tape like so, pull this together, kind of like this bunch together because it makes it easier for me to see what it is I'm working on. Keeps it away from the Conan piece itself because I don't want that touching him. There we go. All masked up and ready to go. 
So uh, my next step here would be to start masking uh, maybe around his belt and around his helmet, the areas that I do not want to be painted. So I'm going to do that. Uh, I'll use a variation of the tape, maybe some of the masking fluid here, and then we'll get on to the uh, task at hand here, and that is repainting this uh, custom rephrase. And so then we'll get on to the task of repainting this pre-painted Conan the Brutal. All right, so now we can see that, uh, you know, I've got most of the masking done here. In fact, um, I'm, I'm pretty happy with it so far. Uh, I think it's going to work just well. Um, I use a combination of blue tape and then just standard uh, uh, masking tape here, the, the beige stuff. Uh, the beige stuff is a little more tacky, um, so I'm really careful where I put that uh, type of material. Um, it shouldn't be a problem with these uh, paint jobs. Um, usually you'll get some lifting with this type of work when I do my normal uh, modeling work. So I, I'm generally pretty careful where I use this stuff. But uh, as you can see, I've used, uh, in the case of the shield here, I just had some plastic bags here. I slipped the back of the bag, and I've slipped it over the back and taped it up on the back side paying close attention to the detail here around his arm and um, and then you can also see here maybe on the back of his head um, where the hair you know I've taped up his helmet and everything and these are lots of little bits of tape here but then as I get down here towards the end let me just use a little brush here um, you can see maybe some of the white here this is the uh, masking fluid uh, that I used here on this so I mask the vast majority of it with tape and then just come along and treat these edges. Now the edges aren't perfect and I realize that and so I will touch those up at the end but for the most part um, uh, you know it's covered um, and it's great. Uh, that way I don't have to spend a whole lot of time with the regular tape trying to cut all these little intricate details. Plus when you put this um, uh, uh, masking um, material on you can use a smaller brush um, maybe even smaller than this one and just kind of wiggle it along the edges here and I'll just do it with this other hand just kind of wiggle the brush along the edges there a little bit and, and create more of a, a broken up edge that looks more like real hair so uh, you don't want to do too much of that you want to you don't want to uh, have like really long stray hairs hanging out there because the uh, the masking fluid well, it's really thin and then it's hard to peel it off. So I tend to clump it up a little bit more and that's why you see it uh, kind of white here. Um, as this dries, it will dry clear. It does have a slight, slight uh, blue tint to it. Very, very slight. Um, but that's nice in case you're putting it on, you know, something that's white. You know, you can you can tell where you put the fluid and where you have it. But this will dry, and that'll that'll turn kind of a clear. It has a light milkiness to it, uh, and then that's it. So I'm gonna wait for this to dry. Um, this process here, uh, taping all this up, um, I don't know, maybe about three hours to get all of these edges just right. And I really, really just focus on the edges here. Uh, so as you can see, it's it's not a an easy process. I mean, well, the the technique is easy. It's just time consuming, and uh, you know this is why we can't do this on a massive scale. So it would be great if we could, uh, but that's just not the case. So uh, there it is. Uh, he's going to be ready to paint here uh, very shortly. Now, I am going to paint right over the flesh here. I'm not going to try to. Um, um, do any type of primer coat on it. The the uh, paint that's here is great. I might wipe it down just a little bit with some alcohol, uh, just to make sure where I've been handling it. I don't I don't have any oil residue from my hand, which would you know react with the paint. Um, I've got a little bobble right here on his arm that I want to try and take care of. Uh, there's just a little tiny thing in the manufacturing there. Uh, that I'm going to take care of, and um, and then I think we're ready to go. Uh, so let's talk about paint uh, while I'm here. Um, he's got these scars on his legs, these little battle wounds, and so those are typically either lighter or darker. They're just a different color. Um, you know, I guess it really kind of depends on the wound there. I'm going to make them a little bit darker than the rest of his skin. Um, his lips would be a little darker as well, maybe a little bit more of a red. Um, and his nipples, of course, the same kind of thing. Uh, so all of those are going to get a little bit of different treatment. If I spin this around, um, we were to think about his arms here. Um, um, the um, 
veins on his arms have been sculpted in. So I want to give those a little bit of work as well. So I'll take just a regular brush, just a, one of my paint brushes over there, and I'm actually going to add a little blue to that first. And I'm actually going to lay that color down first, and then I'm going to lay the skin tones on top of it. And that'll help kind of seal the idea that this is a blood vessel underneath his skin. So a very standard technique there for that. Um, but I'll do that. As far as the, the nipples and maybe the scars, that stuff will probably be done after the skin tones um, using an airbrush uh, just to bring those details in and I can soften it up as much as I want. I may also go in and go ahead and start painting some of the uh, darker areas, some of these shadows in here. I may pre-shade this uh, before I put the skin tones. So let's talk about the, the paint for just a moment uh, because obviously we're having to wait for the, uh, for the um, uh, latex to dry here. But um, I have a base skin tone that I want to use here. It's a nice, um, nice kind of a cocoa brown here. Um, I really like this color. I've used it on another kit and it works great for this type of skin tone. Uh, so I'm going to use this. Um, I don't know if you can see that quite so well. Um, I may add just a little more brown to it, but I kind of like using it as light as it is uh, and just putting it right over. Uh, this was a mixture of um, some burnt sienna and a little bit of, I believe, some fleshy kind of a pinkish color that I've uh, had. I, I've had this mixed up for some time. I've used it on several other kits. It's just something that I mix up. I got something that I like, and, uh, and I just keep a jar of it. Uh, but otherwise, you know, I might would take some burnt sienna, and um, burnt sienna has kind of a reddish color to it anyway. It's a, it's a great color to start with as far as a flesh tone goes. It gives you a good red base to it. Um, another color that's good uh, to use is raw sienna. Uh, now raw is um, still kind of a brownish color here. Works really great and it has you know just a just the slightest maybe red to it but not really. Nowhere near as much as the burnt. Uh, sienna. It's a much, much redder color. And so I really like using these two colors. In fact, you can mix a little of them together if you want to tone this down a little bit and then throw in some white in there. Uh, in my case, a lot of times I'll use a, um, this is called, um, they call it Indian Rose. And it's kind of a, just a real fleshy, pinky color. It's real like anime flesh pink. Um, is this color here and I like using it as well because it's already pretty close in the ballpark um, I'm just warming it up a little bit to look a little more uh, natural um, I have another variation on that um, this is called Valentine pink and this is from a different company they're all basically the same stuff uh, these apple barrel and Delta ceramic coat and Americana these are all just inexpensive um, acrylic paints they're not super pigmented um, um, but you know they work pretty good I, I don't mind using them especially on my statues um, occasionally I'll break over into some other paints and you've probably seen me talk about these in uh, in other videos uh, Liquitex makes a great um, set of paints these are the concentrated this is a very old bottle here uh, it lasts forever as long as you keep it sealed up uh, but once again all acrylics I, I like shooting acrylics I will shoot enamels occasionally when I need to uh, but in a case like this I like using the acrylics um, and there is several other ones out there uh, Liquitex comes in a tube and this one is just uh, disastrous I actually stole this from my wife's uh, stash my wife is a traditional 2d painter and uh, so shh, don't tell her I stole these from her uh, yellow oxide is a great color for for mixing up some fleshes I really like using that and then this is another um, this is another burnt sienna here. So um, the the thing with these paints, these two paints, is they're much more concentrated and they're thicker. Uh, so you see how red that one is. I mean, it's like crazy red, uh, and that's because it's a very very heavy pigmented color. Um, these paints are great. A little uh, a little bit of this goes a long long way when we come to painting this type of stuff. Um, especially when we're uh, pushing it through an airbrush because we obviously have to thin that down. Um, I was just going to see here. There's another brand in here that I have um, and I've used on the uh, Mars Attack piece. This is uh, this is just a um, I don't even know who this is. Master's Touch. Um, I think this is kind of like the uh, the store brand for Hobby Lobby. Um, anyway, um, not a super heavy pigmented paint, but it works great. Um, I actually like using it. Uh, this is 
I just started using this on the uh, Mars Attacks piece. It's like four bucks for this tube, uh, and it works really well. Uh, not as heavily pigmented as these, the Liquitex. Now, the Liquitex tube like this is going to be probably closer to seven to ten dollars, about twice as much as this, and it's about half as much uh, paint in there, but super, super concentrated. So, um, that's enough with the paints. Um, we will get into that, in, uh, and I'll show you how I'm going to paint this up. Like I said, I am going to wash them down with alcohol first, and then I'm going to start with the blue veining and then some of the uh, shadows uh, in here, appreciating that. Now, what am I going to appreciate it with? Well, I'm probably going to uh, start off with something like the Burnt Sienna, just straight out of the bottle here. Uh, just thin it down a little bit and, and shoot that in there. And then when I lay this other color on top of it, it's going to lighten that up a little bit. So that's, that's the goal here. Uh, we'll see how well that works out. Um, to thin all of these paints, of course, I I always go with this. It's the uh, Future Floor Wax. Um, to me, it, it doesn't get any better than this because once those paints dry with this Future Floor Wax, that's it. They're locked in. They're, they are almost like enamels at that point. It is amazing how well this will lock your paint into place. So um, this is what I use for that. And, uh, you know, this huge bottle, it has taken me years to go through all of this. Um, you can see it's <laughs> it's been around for a little while here, uh, but this is great stuff. Won't do without it. And then, of course, I have my uh, secret recipe here for thinning paints as well. So, you know, I might use some future, but if I need to thin it even more to get into my airbrush, my little secret recipe here, uh, about 10% alcohol, um, either reverse osmosis water, what we call RO water, or at least filtered water, and then uh, just a couple of drops of uh, dishwashing liquid. And what that does is the alcohol gives it a little bit of a bite, so it'll bite into whatever it is you're painting on. The distilled water just means there's no heavy minerals and things like that. We do have heavy minerals in my area here, so uh, I usually uh, use reverse osmosis water, which is just like some of the purest water you can get. Um, I just use that and then um, just a couple drops of dish liquid which help break up the surface tension of the water and help the paint flow even more. So uh, I just won't do without these two products whenever I'm painting. Uh, that's just all there is to it. So uh, there you go. So in the next video we will start applying paint here and you can see how all this works. And like I said, I'm probably going to string all of these videos together into one long uh, continuous project. So there you go. Till next time. So here we see the result of the vein work that I've put in here. It's really over the top. I used a really dark blue for that. Uh, I also used a, um, a really kind of a reddish, this is the Liquitex um, Burnt Sienna here. It's a really, really red kind of a color. Um, and I put that here for the scar tissue. Uh, so right now this looks way over the top, way too contrasty. Uh, but that's okay uh, because what's going to happen next is that I'm going to put my flesh tone that I've mixed up over all of this and it's going to tone all this down. Now I also used a combination of the same um, uh, burn umber here along with um, a little bit of another color here. Um, I'm sorry, the burnt sienna. The, the red color is a burnt sienna and then I mix in a little burnt umber under it into that to darken it down a little bit more, flatten it down a little bit more. And that's what I put into the creases of his muscle tone here. So I've really just gone through here with my airbrush, picked out all of the muscle tone. Uh, it doesn't have to be perfect. Um, I try to keep it consistent. Um, and then whenever I lay down the flesh tone over all of this, that'll all even out. And these are going to be just like uh, just darker areas. And this is this is what we call pre-shading. You've probably heard of this before. Um, so it's really going to help it out um, look more three-dimensional. Um, and then I have the option to come back. Uh, once I put down the flesh tone and go back over the top of it again with more of this same color or something very similar to it, typically what I do is I take the flesh tone and then I mix in these darker tones into the same flesh tone, just deepen it down a little bit more and brush those into those areas. And then I go back in and I do the highlights as well, which, you know, these uh, particular statues, in fact, most of them, not all of them, but most of them don't have highlights uh, in them. So uh, I'll definitely do that. Once again, take the flesh tone and I'll light it up considerably and then use that to paint in just the highest recesses here the outermost areas here of uh, his muscle tone just to pick that out and just you know give it even more depth 
So um, right now it looks like a bit of a train wreck, uh, and they usually do at this point. They look pretty bad. Um, <laughs> he looks like he has uh, been through the ringer here. Uh, but once we put that flesh tone in, uh, it's actually going to tame this down. Now, one other thing that I did, and I don't know that the camera is going to pick this up, but anywhere I have flesh tone going into, say, the gloves or the belt area or the boots, I've tried to also spray some of this darker color in there and appreciate that a little bit as well. I always like to see that skin just, you know, look a little darker in those areas. It just kind of helps sell the effect. So, uh, so there you have it. Um, you know, just the next step in the process here of pre-shading this uh, before we finish up with the final paint. Okay, so I've laid in the base coats here. Uh, I've got all the little recesses painted up. And so now I just want to take my flesh tone and put over the top of that. Now this flesh tone is um, a little bit darker, um, um, just a little bit uh, uh, of a different tone than what we originally intended for this character. Uh, but this was a client request here. So, um, you know, we'll paint it up however they want. That's, that's fine. So, um, I am just going to start laying in this color. I'm going to turn on my exhaust fan here so this might get a little noisy. Um, the microphone here has changed because I had to use a lavalier mic. So, um, if there's a shift in the audio uh, for the video, I apologize, but that's just kind of the way production goes. So, here we go. I'm going to start laying in this flesh tone color. Now I'm going to have to build this up in several layers. So I'm not trying to just get it all in one coat here. I'm just going to paint a little on. And I'm going to let it dry. And I'm using future floor wax in this paint. And that's going to help me uh, give it a little more working time. Um, not only does it thin the color out, but it gives me more time to work with it. And it lets it level out too, which is always really nice. Down in these recesses here, pretty good. Whoops! That's one of the things with these open cups. You gotta be very careful with them. I got my cup a little full there. Alright. And I'm not worried about the details in his face because I'm going to come back in and paint those in over this. And I'll probably do that with a hand brush uh, rather than an airbrush. So I'm not worried about this too much. Same with the details in his hair. I mean, I've covered most of all that stuff up. And uh, you can see the little bits of hair that are leaking out here that are not covered by tape. Those are covered by the uh, liquid latex. So uh, those should be fine. Once again, I can always touch that up, especially the edges. I'll go back in and touch that up a little bit as well. And uh, I got some other little things I've got planned for this particular piece uh, once I finish the base coat here. Just, just stuff that I like to see added to it that, you know, just can't do it at the factory. It just takes way too long. Uh, but it's a neat little process that you can use uh, and customize your own. So, uh, so here we go. I'm going to try to spin this around so you can see the details on this vein. So. You know, we painted this, when I painted this, you know, it was like a really, really bright blue. But now look at where the flesh tone is going over. It's toning that down. And the more I add to this, the more that's going to tone down and settle down into uh, like a layer of the skin. So it'll actually look like it's under the skin. So I'm just, like I said, building up in layers. I'm not trying to cover it all in one shot. Just building it up slowly. And I've been told that I have a pretty good patience, um, and I do. I have patience for a lot of things, uh, but painting is maybe not one of them. Uh, <laughs> sometimes I'll rush a paint job uh, just because I want to see, I'm just so excited to see the finished piece. I, I really want to get to that point, you know. But uh, when it comes to working on a client piece, no way, man. I take my time. I, I, I fight those urges as much as possible. I take my time because I want this thing to be just right. And I think that's uh, that's true for a lot of folks. They wanna they wanna rush past the part that they don't like so much and and get to the part they do like. For me, I like the um, I like the construction more than anything else. Oddly enough, uh, when it comes to the painting, um, I can I can get really creative with that sometimes, and uh, 
and I can take my time there. But uh, you know, I can I can also get get ahead of myself sometimes. So building up these layers sometimes just seems to, it's, it's agony for me because I'm waiting for the paint to dry so that I can put a clear coat on it and I gotta wait for that to dry and then I gotta put another layer of paint on it and uh, and do that sort of thing. So, uh, but it's well worth it in the end. Once you once you do this a few times and you you see the results of building up those layers. Oh my goodness, there's just nothing like it. Look at that out a little bit. Whoa. That's the one downside to the uh, to the uh, future floor wax. When you it dries slow normally, but when you start shooting it with air, <laughs> it can it can dry a little faster and clog up your airbrush. So that can be very frustrating. So just clear it out, keep going. And this airbrush that I'm using is probably oh my goodness, it's at least 25 years old, maybe even a little older. Um, it's a Pache VLS. Um, I've got other airbrushes, and uh, this is just kind of my go-to guy here. This is my workhorse. Uh, it's seen a lot. It's got me through a lot. Uh, as, <laughs> as an airbrush goes, I don't, you know. But uh, I still enjoy shooting it. I like the feel of it. I guess maybe I'm just used to it after so many years. Um, but honestly, uh, any airbrush, and I've said this before in some of my other videos, it's not... It's not the brush, it's the man wielding the brush that makes the difference. So, or woman in this case, I shouldn't say that. Uh, I shouldn't say that. I keep, I keep referring to this as a, uh, or see this as a male-only hobby, but it is not. There are plenty of talented uh, women out there doing this, and uh, so I probably shouldn't refer to it as us guys all the time. But it's not just us guys. Uh, just some of my useless rambling here. This is the tough part, where we get into these little crevices. This is the hardest part for uh, for anybody that's working on uh, pre-painted statues because they're not model kits; they're, they're already assembled. And uh, so, trying to get down in these little crevices and stuff like that can be really tricky. Um, but uh, you know, it's just one of those things. It's that's just part of the hobby. And if you want to customize it, well, then that's your statue. That is, then you just gotta learn to deal with it, contend with that. And it's not too bad. Um, that's one of the reasons that, as a kid, be careful because I'm tilting my cup there too much. Um, as a kid, you know, we decided on this particular uh, statue. If you're going to buy the unpainted statue, we wanted it to be more like a true kit. And instead of it being assembled, we wanted it primarily uh, parts, just like uh, just like the factory would put the parts together. We're just telling the factory do not assemble it, um, and uh, and just make accommodations there in the construction of the foam. So that's why when you see the foam in this particular case uh, for this particular uh, statue, it looks a little weird. There's a lot of funny-looking little cavities there. Um, it doesn't necessarily form fit like you would think. I mean, it does, you know form to the statue to keep it protected, but there's some extra cavities and stuff in there because we're using the same box, the same foam for the kit. And the kit, well, it's it, it's parted. It's not all put together. So they had to make some accommodations there, and I think it works out really well. You get a really nice box, and then once you do assemble the kit, guess what? It still fits in that box because it's the same box we put these assembled statues in. So it makes it really nice to travel with. So, But uh, there you have it. So there's the first coat here on his chest. I'm going to build a little more down here at the bottom. And I could just kind of touch up different little spots right now as I'm going. But I, I'm trying not to cover up too much. I'm trying not to do too much here because, once again, I want to build up this idea of layers. And what's going to help me do that is the clear coat I'm going to slap on this bad boy. Um, just that little microscopic distance between the layers of paint just really sells the idea that you know this is more like real skin. Uh, it has a little bit of translucency to it. So, 
So there you have it. See, it's all nice and toned down now with a little more in the space here. This little spot here. Oh yeah, it's coming together now. So just uh, just take a look at that. Um, notice here on the legs, see the, the difference here. Um, the skin tone, like I said, we had decided to go with a lighter skin tone, and now uh, I had a client send this one back, as I said before, that wanted me to darken it down for them. Uh, and this particular client is a longtime client of ours. I think uh, this gentleman owns about every piece we've ever uh, done. And, um, and just simply made a request that, hey, could I get this darkened down? So um, we worked out a, a deal here, and so uh, here we are, painted up for him. And I'm, and I'm hoping um, that, uh, that he's liking it, and so that's, uh, that's going to be my next step. I'm going to finish this out, shoot a few pictures, send them to my client, and see what he thinks. And hopefully this is the right direction that we're uh, going in here for him, and, um, and we can move on to the next step. So I'm going to finish this up. Uh, I'm going to try to shut up and uh, and just uh, let the video run. All right. Well, now I'm looking at it <clears throat> after um, the first coat of paint here. It's looking pretty good. Um, not too bad. I'm liking it, um, at least for the first layer. Now, I still haven't covered up all that I want to cover up here. Uh, so I'm going to go back in and I'm going to cover up a little more of the vein work so that it, it really kind of disappears into the skin tone. But overall, this is starting to look exactly what I'm wanting. So uh, I want to uh, I want to let this dry and then I'm going to hit it with some clear coat. And uh, typically the way I do the clear coat is I just get a rattle can. Um, I've got different types that I use. Uh, this is a Rust-Oleum. I like to use lacquer uh, when I can. Uh, let's put this up there. So this is just Rust-Oleum lacquer. Uh, this one's a high luster, so it's a high gloss. I use this anytime I want to apply uh, decals or something like that. So on this one, I'm not going to do any decal work. Uh, this I primarily, like I said, stick for, uh, use that for cars and different things, vehicles that are going to have uh, decals because I need that nice slick surface that the gloss coat gives me. And in this case, I don't need that. In fact, I want exactly the opposite. I want it more matte. So I also have a can of that that's in a matte coating. And so as soon as this dries, I'm going to shoot some of that on there. And, um, and then I'll layer on another layer of this color over the top of that. And what I'll do is I'll lighten it up just ever so slightly and, um, and then shoot that over the top. And we just kind of go back and forth between the clear coat and the color coats and that just builds it up uh, this little skin tone and you know it's usually a couple coats sometimes maybe a third coat uh, is necessary but typically uh, I can do this in two coats and it looks really really nice so uh, okay, so um, the paint is sufficiently dried now it's dry to the touch and it, uh, it looks pretty good um, so I want to put my clear coat on here now, I mentioned before the different types of clear coat that I use, and in this case, I'm going to be using, um, this one is actually a Krylon brand. It's a uh, matte finish. It's an artist's uh, sealer, basically. Um, but, you know, basically, this is either uh, lacquer-based or perhaps even acrylic-based, but I have it sitting in this little uh, jug here of hot water. And um, the water's not, like, extremely hot, but it is pretty warm. And what that does is just heat it up inside, and... Um, and it really does make a difference. It seems to make it flow a little better. So I'm just going to give it a good shake here. Uh, the one thing you want to be mindful of is if you get this water too hot and you put that uh, can in there, there is the likelihood it will explode. So we'll just get that out of the way. Um, so I don't want to get it too hot, uh, but you know, good, good warm water. I mean, the can is pretty hot in my hand, so I might have gotten that a little hot. But, um, what it does is it kind of loosens up the paint inside. And uh, I don't know, it just makes it flow a little better. So anytime I'm going to use what we call the good old uh, rattle bomb or the rattle can here, um, you know, I always dunk it in a little bit of warm water and, and heat the paint up a little bit. Uh, like I said, it just it seems to make it flow a little better. Can right, so we give it a good shake here? And uh, here we go.
lift him up here. And I don't have to do a very heavy coat. Uh, once again, I kind of layer this up a little bit. And underneath his garment here. There we go. And it goes right back. So uh, I'll let this dry. Uh, it is, uh, this is uh, lacquer based here, I do believe. Uh, it certainly smells it, um, which is something you definitely <laughs> probably shouldn't be doing, probably killing brain cells at the moment, and I don't have any to spare. So definitely wear a respirator if you're going to do this sort of stuff. I have my fan like right here, so it's sucking that right on out. Uh, not a big deal. Uh, but I generally, you know, I put this in an open area to spray it or at least wear my respirator. But if I had my respirator on, you wouldn't be able to hear me. So, hey, listen, I'm taking one for you guys. Um, anyway, shoot a little Krylon or, or whatever your favorite uh, flavor uh, or brand of, uh, of clear finish. Uh, like I said, I use a mat. I like to use a mat in situations like this. Um, and just get a nice little light coat on there let that dry and then I'll be able to uh, go back and lay on another layer of this and in fact you know you can do this depending on what the effect is you're trying to create um, you could layer this on and then come back in and pick out more details if you wanted to and then paint over the top of that and then just keep going but basically every coat of paint that I put on I try to put a layer of clear over the top of that and it, and it does build up those little layers of paint and give this thing some depth. So uh, there you have it, a um, little bit of clear coat on top. All right, now that first uh, clear coat has dried, I can go ahead and do another application of the skin tone here. So what I want to do is just show you kind of the results of this. I'm going to zoom in on this a little bit. Once the uh, clear coat dries, you get a really, really interesting effect with the paint itself. So I'm going to zoom in here and I'm also going to have to adjust this up ever so slightly. I'm sorry for the camera bobble here. Uh, but um, now you can see, you know, kind of what's happening here with it. Um, the, let me get my little pointer here. The, uh, the under colors here, like on the scars and the uh, vein work here, are much more visible now. So as before, when I put the, the uh, color coat on, I was really covering those up a good bit. And now that I've put the clear coat on, what's happened is it has actually melted this top load of layer of paint into the bottom there. So you get a lot more details uh, showing up in here. And it's, uh, it's really, really impressive. And it's one of those things you just have to experience for yourself. But I'm using acrylic paint and I'm using a lacquer-based clear over it. And that, I guess the solvents in that lacquer just kind of melt the uh, the layers of paint together so it's a really interesting effect and I, and I really like using it um, it does take a little bit of planning because as I'm painting am I covering too much am I covering not enough well that will become very clear once you put the clear coat on if if you think you've got it too uh, you've covered it up too much that clear coat could reveal that nope you didn't you did just enough or or not enough and so I can see here that I definitely want to cover up this vein work even more so I'm going to go over that area and work it some more and then just go over the whole entire body just a little bit more with my skin tones so I'm going to back this uh, video back out here just a little bit and uh, that way we can see this I'm going to go back the other way here I'm not going to go too far this time that way you can actually see the application of the paint and um, once again here we go with some skin tone. Now what I did with the skin tones this time is same paint, but I did thin it down with a little more of the Future Floor Wax.
So he's getting more of that uh, tanned look, if you will. Um, it's not too bad. I am going to go back in and overwork, or, or I'm sorry, work over the uh, veins just a little bit more. Some of the larger veins, I'm going to work over those a little bit more. And, uh, and then I think we're about ready to call this guy done. It's looking pretty good. All right, so now that we've got um, got the uh, base coats down, uh, I've covered up the veins just a little bit more where they were just a, a little too dark. I just went over those areas in particular with a little more of the base coat paint uh, just to kind of hide those a little bit more. I think I got a nice effect with that now. Uh, so now I want to start going in and laying in some highlights here. So um, in this case, I'm just going to touch on some of these little areas here. Uh, just where I think the highlight should be. As far as my highlight color, I took the base skin tone color, and I don't know if you can see inside that color cup or not, if I can get this over here. Um, but basically I just took the uh, skin tone color and I added a little more of a fleshy pink color to it to lighten it up. It was a very light color. And then I also put a little bit of uh, yellow ochre in there is where to warm it up because the pink was a little too pink and I want it to be a little warmer. Um, but it's still a, a much lighter color than the, uh, the base color and so let's we'll see what we can get. Alrighty.
Well, there you have it, folks, a custom-painted prepaint statue. Now, I'm going to encourage you that if you find one of your statues on the shelf that you think needs just a little extra tweaking, go ahead and break that bad boy off the shelf and give it a try for yourself. Now, a simple project might include just applying a wash or two to bring out some of the details, or perhaps a little dry brushing to bring out other details. I think the biggest challenge you're going to find if you decide to go ahead and repaint the statue is the fact that it is a statue and not a model kit. So these statues don't come apart. Now it is possible to perhaps soak the glue joints in some fluids there. Uh, there are some degreasers, some very heavy commercial grade degreasers that might would break it down and you could maybe wiggle the parts apart. But traditionally what happens is that these factories use a really high grade epoxy and what you're going to end up with is possibly breaking or fracturing your statue. And instead, just brush up on your masking techniques. There's lots of different tools you can use for masking and you can get some absolutely wonderful results. Now I used the tape and I used uh, plastic bags to cover the larger areas. I even used a little bit of liquid masking fluid or liquid frisket. It's just liquid latex to uh, mask out some of the detail areas. But another tool that you can use is called Silly Putty. Yeah, that's right. That wonderful little toy that we had as a kid, the little putty that just never seems to stick to anything except for the cartoon papers and you could pull up the cartoon papers, the ink would be on there, and you could stretch the little characters. It was awesome. Well, I still play with that today here at 46, only I play with it on the models here. I use it when I need a really soft edge for the mask. And primarily, I don't use it on these types of statues, although you could, but anywhere you need a soft edge for your paint. Now, I use it for camouflage patterns, so maybe a pattern on some clothing or something like that it would be great. I'm sure there's other techniques that you could explore and experiment with and, and work out a great, great masking workflow for yourself. Well, I hope to see you next time, folks, here at Quarantine Studio.